Good afternoon. I'll call the March 16th meeting of the Ag Finance and Policy Committee to order. Uh, this remote meeting will be held in accordance with House Rule 10.01. Mr. Smith, please call the roll. Chair Sundin. Here. Vice Chair Vang. Here. Uh, Representative Anderson. Anderson present. Uh, Representative Eklund. Present. Representative Burkle. Present. Representative Hanson R. Hanson R. Present. Representative Hanson J. Hanson J. Present. Representative Cleveland. Cleveland Present. Representative Lippert. Lippert Present. Representative Lewick. Lewick Present. Representative Miller. Miller Present. Present. Representative Nelson. Nelson Present. Representative Thompson. Thompson Present. We have a quorum, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, we have the minutes of the uh, March 14th uh, meeting before us. I uh, hope uh, Representative Thompson has uh, had a chance to see them. And uh, do you have a motion? Just to move. Thank you. Thompson uh, uh, moves uh, approval of the minutes. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, hearing none, uh, those minutes uh, pr uh, prevail. Uh, we have four bills up today. We'll have to scoot right through them. Uh, so be clear with your questions, be clear with your answers. Uh, Representative Thompson, we'll start with you and continue the important discussion of food, deserts, and emerging farmers. House file 4106, please uh, talk about your bill and uh, we have about 20 minutes blocked for this. Representative Thompson. Thank, thank you, Chair, for having and, and the committee for having me uh, introduce this language here. Um, this is a bill uh, in regards to 4106. This is an African American African Growers and African Growers Produce Alliance. And this bill is necessary, I think, is because we have farming disparities here in the state. African American and, 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 Af and African immigrant farmers also have barriers. Uh, the startup cost, equipment, fencing, education and training, greenhouse challenges, access to loans, uh, regulations, distance to land, gas expenses, drought, lack of representation and advocacy. Uh, the, the, the benefits I see with this particular bill is we can actually um, improve our access to healthy foods and, and, and that are healing our body, increase food security and equity, um, less dependence on food assistance. It adds to the food systems. So it's a source of income, uh, culturally relevant technical assistance, education and community outreach is something that I'm very uh, passionate about. Indirect financial assistance. Um, I think I share with, uh, with you, Chair, in a personal conversation, how we used to teach our kids, Old McDonald has a farm. And I honestly don't see that man having a farm here in the state. I don't even know Old McDonald anymore. So I wanna, wanna try to bring some type of uh, language to the body and hope support me in, in actually bringing resources to the community who I feel is left out of the farming industry. Uh, these are career pathways that have been snatched away from our youngsters at, at, a, at a, a high school, elementary school level. Uh, I know if our kids see it, they can be it. And so I wanna make sure that I'm covering all bases when it comes to our future. Uh, because, because all of us are gonna need these youngsters. All of us are gonna be 65 years old one day. We're gonna need them to take care of us. And so I wanna make sure that I'm, I'm actually advocating for our future. We're actually benefiting off of the work from other leaders prior to us. And so we probably won't see the benefits or the fruits of our labor. If we pass good legislation now, the payoff will be greater later. And with that chair, I wanna pass I don't want to take too much time over to uh, this is important language. So I'm going to pass it over to Moses, who's one of our speakers. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, I'm going to uh, interject here for a second. We've only got 20 minutes per bill here. So uh, I see you've got a, a total of eight testifiers. If you can winnow that down so that your message gets across clear with just a, a few testimire, testifiers, I'd appreciate that. Yeah, I don't think we need eight. Good. Continue, please. Testifier can identify himself or herself and uh, proceed. 
Thank you, uh, Chair, Mr. Uh, Representative uh, Mike Sandin, um, the Vice Chair Samantha Veng, uh, and all committee members. Um, I'm here to testify today on behalf of other African growers and producers in the state of Minnesota. As an African farmer myself, I would like to express my very strong support for uh, this bill, H uh, House File 4106, an act to appropriate uh, $4 million to the Commission of Agriculture for the work of the African Growers and Producers Alliance and African uh, American Urban Agriculture Farmers. We are all grateful to Representative John Thompson for having recognized the need and taken the initiative to introduce this bill. I feel strongly that establishing a support system within the Minnesota Department of Agriculture's Emerging Farmers Office will promote regenerative agriculture in our communities, support agricultural entrepreneurs who will be a backbone to a healthy agricultural economy, and uh, they will grow a healthy food for the community, protect our water qualities, um, and foster prosperity among uh, the minority population. My own story illustrates the need and uh, the opportunity represented by this bill. After moving to this uh, region from Kenya in 2004, I first began growing fresh produce in community plots in Hopkins, Minnesota, and I was selling that to friends. In 2009, I moved to Big River Farms in Stillwater in search of training because I felt uh, I needed to you know, do better. I farmed there for two years. After that, I rented farms uh, in uh, Wisconsin and Minnesota. Uh, which allowed me to establish as a beginning farmer uh, for the purposes of uh, being eligible for the USDS uh, beginner farmer loan. In 2014, I obtained a loan and I was able to purchase 20 acres in Cambridge, Minnesota, which is 60 miles north of the cities. I continued selling at the farmer's markets, but in 2020, uh, Seeing no other African uh, immigrants like me at the farmer's market, I decided to invite a group of uh, other farmers to come and mentor uh, at my farm. I can show them all the work I was doing. That turned out to be 13 farmers that year. And then the following year, it, uh, which was 2021, it turned out to be, uh, over 20 farmers. So earlier, in, um, you know, recognized the large number of farmers from uh, the different regions of Africa who had come out, we decided as a group of farmers to form African Growers and Producer Alliance Group, because um, which is pending now on uh, as a tax exempt uh, status, because uh, we felt that there was this big, uh, um, like people had come out. Uh, so the farmers, all the farmers I work with have a, a farming background and are seeking culturally relevant technical assistance to grow produce and farm product and also access reliable market. They are struggling to build a community and They'd, they'd like to change uh, the, you know, like the image that, you know, there are fewer or no black farmers uh, in Minnesota. They have come together and they are ready to enrich Minnesota's farming landscape. But I know that they are only seeing farming resources from a distance. They are not easily accessing these federal, state and local resources that may be appropriate to need their needs. I know this because I myself, it took me seven years to own land. 
uh, because I did not readily uh, access appropriate and casual relevant technical assistance. My current training offerings that I'm giving uh, to the farmers uh, work, but I am one hour away from the cities for most of these farmers. Last summer, one farmer that I work with drove roughly about 10,000 miles to my farm to get mentored. She was determined to get mentorship, even at this significant cost, um, just like I was uh, when I did seven years to be eligible uh, to get a uh, to buy a land and uh, be a farm. However, her challenge prompted me to find land closer to the cities. I also was running out of space at my farm because there were like 13 of them and I was giving a quarter plot each. Um, so I ended up even renting more land in Lino Lake and having some of these farmers closer to the cities because of that. Um, so between all this, I also continued doing outreach work. I do outreach on, uh, on behalf of renewing the countryside uh, as a, a coordinator to the minority uh, or the underserved communities. And this highlights the, uh, the, the renewing the countryside is, a call, uh, is doing this on a grant from the USDA. And this in a larger scale shows that this community is not, uh, you, know, you know, there is a lack of uh, access to these resources. Um, black farmers traditional black farmers traditional agricultural practices are among the many that will help increase access to healthy and affordable food in the Minnesota. HF 4106 could help capitalize the high interest in farming in many African communities. Um, I, uh, excuse me, uh, you know, I really appreciate uh, a good report on uh, you utilizing uh, the programs ahead of us. Are there other testifiers that are going to weigh in? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, sure. President Thompson, do you have other test testifiers? Uh, good day. Can you hear me? My name is uh, Michael Cheney. Cheney, please, Cheney. Yes. I've Hello, how you, how, thank you for taking us today uh, and hearing us. Thank you, John, for advancing this important legislation. Um, as folks may or may not know that in 2016, we came forward to birth some, what we were told, cutting edge legislation, advancing the urban farm movement in this state. And so we were trailblazers in really trying to open up the portal to the future created the Agri Grant that now um, has gone into uh, its last four or five years of, of deploying resources. I'm, I'm really shocked and appalled that given the recent incidents that have happened, the murder of George Floyd, the uh, COVID virus, that rather than use an urban farming to be a way to access equity and inclusion that we've really sev severed the root and really left out African Americans and African descendants of, uh, from this process, given the role that we have played historically in agriculture. Time and time again, myself and other advocates have really tried to move the needle to be all inclusive and to include all people. And so I'm very frustrated and I'm upset with my other communities of minorities that we wouldn't walk as one, act as one, and the same way that this civil rights movement. I say that urban farming, local food production is the latest iteration of the civil rights movement. And that given uh, President Biden's efforts to grow farming and to grow equity in this country, I would urge this committee to follow suit and realize that we have a role to play in the building of the future of agriculture. I'm currently working, I've been asked by the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture approach project Sweetie Pie. They are uh, creating a new project called the People's Garden 
They've selected 17 cities across the United States that are, in essence, kind of replicating Victory Gardens. We are going to be doing one in North Minneapolis. And so we've been very successful. The legislation that we birthed, the Agri Grant, is a testament to the vision and the courage of Minnesotans. And I, want, I do not want to sever the relationship between all that we, all peoples in Minnesota, that we represent all and we encourage all to join us in this effort. We also have joined forces with Kimball Musk, who is Elon Musk's brother, and we have created a uh, equity fund. He's put a million dollars to grow in gardens across America and Project Sweetie Pie is on their governance board. So we're doing, we're moving forward and I'll close with one of the first students from Project Sweetie Pie in 2010, uh, uh, one of our step up youth. She was just hired this last fall to become the egg educator for the Minneapolis public schools. We cannot close the door on the future of all young people in Minnesota. We want to make this as rich an experience as we can possibly. And so I urge you all to support Mr. Thompson and this in moving forward to support African and African American descendants to join the community of farmers in Minnesota. Thank you for your message, Mr. Cheney, loud and clear. Much appreciated. Uh, we'll have to move to questions. Uh, we just have a couple of minutes. Uh, Chair Vang, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, perhaps this question is for Mr. Shaney or perhaps Representative Thompson. Um, Mr. Shaney, you seem to suggest that um, with the, there seems to be some competition between other communities of color with African-American growers is that, I just want you to clarify that statement or if that is what you meant, can you help uh, identify where you see examples of that? Well, the, the legislation that is moving to apply resources to the LEDC and to the Hmong community. Again, the civil rights movement was on the backs of African and African, African Americans in this country who have suffered generations and generations of discrimination. I, th I think that if we are going to advance the fate of all, one, we advance the fate of all in moving to add resources and deploy resources in an equal and just fashion. Otherwise, we are only widening the gap of disparities between all of us as communities of color. Mr. Chair. Okay, quick follow-up, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and Mr. Shaney. I really do wish Representative Thompson could have reached out to me to talk about this, because that is a complete misrepresentation of what you just said, Mr. Shaney. Uh, Representative Thompson, you've spoken to me about including um, African-American uh, growers into my legislation. And I've asked you, to give me your language to amend it into my legislation. And you have not responded. So I just wanna be clear with that, that I there was no indication that I will refuse to not include other communities of color. And I want that to be on the record. Um, I've reached out to Representative Thompson if he knows of other African growers and he has not responded to me. So I just want to make sure that's clear. Um, and of course, when we all do better, we all do better. And there is no reason why I would not include African-American growers into my legislation as well. My Thank work you, that I've been doing, we all share that work with all emerging and beginning farmers. That is the goal and to support um, to have that misrepresentation. I'm not OK with that. And so, sorry, Mr. Chair, for my rant. Um, I will just um, leave it at that. Uh, thank you for your comments. Obviously, there's uh, some work to be done here. Uh, and it's uh, not uh, uh, May 23rd or whatever the date is. So there's room for amendments. Uh, uh, Representative Anderson, please. Mr. Chair, thank you. Just a quick question. Um, just wondering about th this new 501c3, the African Growers and Producers Alliance. 
the recipient of, of this potential grant. Um, I think it's fairly new. What's the background? Do they have any any other records with dealing with with grants, that type of thing? Just a little bit more about the organization itself. Representative Thompson, please. Chair, <clears throat> Chair, could could I have him repeat the question? I didn't I didn't fully hear it. Certainly. Representative Anderson, please. Mr. Chair, again, thank you. Well, the African Growers and Producers Alliance, I think, is a fairly new uh, 501c3, and uh, just wondering about you know the history, the background, if 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 they're set up to to handle a grant uh, of this size, fairly substantial, a couple of million dollars. Just talk a little bit about about uh, the alliance itself, please. I'm going to defer it over to Fahir Khalif, if you will, Chair. Okay, uh, Mr. Khalif. Yes, Mr. Chair, thank you, Representative. Uh, uh, oh. um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, hi. Uh, this uh, legislation uh, funding will go to the Department of Agriculture. That's what is gonna go to the grants to be applied to organizations that will be under AGABA. AGABA is for African Growers and Producers Alliance. So there's a lot, several uh, other organizations in there. So when this funding is will not go directly to AGABA, it will go to the Department of Agriculture and then it will be, process through from there once uh, the funding goes to release to the MDA. Thank you. Any follow-up, Representative Anderson? Oh, just, just a quick question again, and, and Mr. Cheney has uh, worked with us uh, over the years and uh, done a good job, great job of uh, working on urban agriculture. And uh, looking back, there was about $2 million available in uh, 2021 and still a half million dollars available in, in this year, 2022. So could, could some of these grants uh, be used in that uh, capacity, the urban ag grants, go to uh, the Producers Alliance? Mr. Cheney. Well, again, I don't think that, that we need to commingle resources. Uh, I think that what we need to do is really, this is agriculture, the world of agriculture is a difficult hill to climb as it were. And again, I think that Moses is a testimony. You know, there's all kinds of Angela Dawson to, to building collaboratives around the growing of hemp. So there's many, many, many innovative projects across the state. This money would certainly go to support the work of Patrice Bailey and Lillian and Otiano, who have been formulating the emerging uh, farmer subcommittee that I know Moses has been a member of it. So again, uh, are they, could they end up, they will all end up under the supervision, the uh, uh, authority of the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. And we just want to make sure that everyone gets access to those opportunities. When we did the urban ag legislation, Representative Hamilton said, do we want this to just be a pilot project in North Minneapolis? Our response was no, we want to grow farmers and young people and agriculture across the state. And so we're not, our, we're, our argument here today is to pro secure the funding so that we can do all of this innovative work and continue to demonstrate to the country that Minnesota is a fair and just state and that we're all concerned about health and well being of all of our citizens. Thank you, Mr. Cheney. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Representative Anderson. Uh, we're moving along here uh, so we don't get bogged down. But uh, any other comments uh, that uh, should be shared with the committee, please submit them in writing. We'll make certain that the committee members get them. Uh, we're running over a little bit on time. So, uh, just a reminder that uh, Representative Thompson uh, has moved at 4106 uh, be laid over for possible inclusion in the supplemental finance bill. And I thank you, Representative Thompson. Do you have a couple of words to wrap up? Yes, Chair. Chair, while, while, while the role of, of agriculture economy has grown, the share of Black farmers in the United States has declined over the last century. Today, just 1.4% of farmers identify as Black or mixed race, compared with about 14% over 100 years ago. And these farmers represent less than 0.5% of the total US farm sales. Further, Black farmers operate at like 70% of the US peer level farm revenue with a 14% operating margin gap versus their peers before government payments. And so what I'm saying is this is not something that I'm trying to like throw at somebody. I'm just trying to work together with 
a diverse group of powerful legislators to bring meaningful legislation that will help the underserved communities. So I don't want to like get into like this community got this or this community got that. I want everybody to get their fair share of the pie because we're all Minnesotans. And I know we can do it together. I can't do this without this body and this committee. I can't do anything without you guys. So I need to work together with you and everybody else to make this a good bill. And, and, and I definitely, definitely would love to work with uh, Vice Chair Vane on this language. I don't know where I missed the uh, missed the mark on that, but I did not mean to to step on any toes. And so I want to circle back with uh, Representative Vang also. But thank great you. idea, great idea. Thank you, Representative Thompson, uh, and uh, thanks to your testifiers today. So uh, uh, House File forty one oh six is laid over. Uh, Representative Burkle, you have House File thirty nine oh three. Uh, would you like to move your bill and uh, talk about it? We, have we just want to thank you, Mr. Chair, for uh, supporting the African growers and, and African American farmers. Thank you so much. Absolutely, for the time. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Representative Burkle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'd like to move House File 3903 be recommended to be referred. And I'm assuming we're going to environment and natural resources as we discussed earlier, correct? Yes. Okay. I also have an author's amendment, Mr. Chair, uh, to kind of get the bill in shape. Let's and, hear your uh, amendment, please. Uh, and I also have an oral amendment we discussed. I hope I can still have some latitude to insert that oral amendment right now. Please. So, um, and if I can defer to Colby Sullivan at some point, but on page one, line eight, before the period, I'd like to insert um, in a drafting error on my part, um, I'd like to insert the, insert the words and the restrictions and requirements imposed by the Board of Animal Health within chronic wasting disease endemic areas, unquote. Okay, uh, is uh, Mr. Sullivan uh, gonna help us out with that? Yeah, Colby, can you confirm that with everyone so we're on the same page? Colby Sullivan, please. Mr. Chair and Representative Burkle, uh, the oral change that Representative Burkle just read uh, would work very well on page one, line eight. So I think we're in good shape. Okay. Uh, move to adopt the uh, oral amendment as presented by Representative Burkle. Uh, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay, we have uh, uh, an amendment to uh, the amendment, I guess. Uh, Correct. I, and, and so back to the amendment, the original amendment. Uh, this amendment would, the amendment. Okay. Yep. Th thank you, Mr. Chair. This amendment would appropriate a million dollars uh, over two years from December of 19 through December of 21 due to movement bans and the endemic zones created uh, during that time and issue payments to uh, farmers on a first come, first served basis. Uh, and that's my amendment, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, he's, uh, Representative Burke will move the uh, amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, well, the uh, amendment is adopted uh, to the bill as amended. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair uh, and members of the committee. Uh, I've drafted House File 3903 kind of in response to numerous calls and emails I've received from deer farmers across the state of Minnesota, um, expressing a lot of serious financial concerns related to the recent deer movement bans. Uh, and beyond the you know, obvious financial stress, uh, you know, farm expenses to pay uh, without adequate revenue to pay those bills. Uh, there's an emotional and mental strain and uh, it's the stress in their vo voices I related to the most, uh, given my own experience with high path avian influenza in 2015. Um, so despite our, you know, whatever our personal views on deer farms are at the moment and you know, the, the oversight and regulation of these farms you know, and what the best possible solutions to address the future of deer farming in Minnesota, you know, going forward here. I think it's incumbent on us to alleviate some of this financial pressure uh, that the state of Minnesota and particularly the Department of Natural Resources have forced these small farms to endure. Um, the discussions we'll have coming up later in this committee concerning deer farm buyouts and moratoriums and, you know, regulatory oversight are extremely important. And, and we'll have those discussions there and then, but I'm hoping right now everyone on the committee has taken the time to read the written testimony. And um, I'm certain that our conversations about House File 3903 and, and the mental and financial stress these folks have endured will be the focus of our comments and questions you know, at the moment. So with that, Mr. Chair, 
I'd like to turn this over to my testifiers and would like to have Mr. Uh, Tim Spreck from the Deer Farmers kind of start things off. Mr. Spreck, please identify yourself and uh, offer your testimony. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, Tim Spreck with the Minnesota Deer Farmers Association. First, I wanna thank you, Mr. Chair, for hearing this bill. This is really something that's greatly important and it's, and it's not about deer farmers, it's about ag and the agricultural family, small family farmers that are trying to grow uh, in the state of Minnesota and trying to remain viable. So my job today, and I thank Representative Burkle for doing an excellent intro. My job today is to help your members understand exactly what we're looking at here and then to immediately get to testifiers because they have a story that's much more compelling than anything I could ever say. And this is their opportunity to get that information out to the committee today. So what we're looking at is uh, two things. We're looking at DNR no movement orders. Um, so the DNR has uh, three times in the last couple of years done a no movement order uh, as a result of, of uh, uh, perceived uh, situations in the, uh, uh, the, in the state that they believe uh, requires them to stop movement of whitetails. So that's one thing. The second thing is, and this is a, a little bit more challenging to understand, when the a CWD positive deer is found in the wild, you could picture a, a map and a pin put at that exact spot. Now this is in the wild, it's important to understand. And what the DNR does is they establish a 15 mile radius around that zone. The Board of Animal Health then adopts that as an endemic zone and it what it does is it captures a number of small family deer farms within that zone and they're precluded from any movement of any animals uh, for a period of three years and that can actually be extended. So they're put out of business for three years. Uh, we're not here to debate the importance or whether or not uh, these movement orders are, are legitimate, but what we're here to do is to help small family farmers who have been financially injured and some to a great degree through no fault of their own because of the heavy hand of government. So with that, Mr. Chair, I will get out of the way and let the testifiers have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Spreck. Uh, we have Steve Porter uh, from uh, Porter Whitetail. Uh, would you please uh, identify yourself and uh, offer your testimony? We just have uh, like a minute, minute and a half per person here. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Steve Porter. I started raising deer back in 1992. I just uh, retired from 30 years of law enforcement and I started showing live trophy whitetail bucks in 1997 at major sports shows all over the upper Midwest, including Little Rock, Arkansas, Bismarck, Green Bay, uh, St. Louis, Missouri, Minneapolis. It's a big, good family business. And I, and I have contracts in place. And all of a sudden, uh, the movement bans come into place. And I'm forced to break contracts. Well, that is my harvest time. That's where I make my money for the year. And so I've had to break numerous contracts. And then, of course, when I break those contracts, all of these major show promoters, they really don't want to hire me in the future because they've spent their advertising budget saying I would be there and now they can't depend on me anymore. So in, in essence, my entertainment business is dead and that's the central cog for my whole farm. I get in front of people. I can make sales for years off of the 40,000 people I speak to at the big sports shows. So I, I, I've lost all that income. The stress is real. In my 30 year career of law enforcement, I have been to numerous stressful situations. I, ca I can't count them all where, where people have done something devastating. And, and I've been to these scenes and I can tell you that the stress in our industry right now that has been placed upon us at no fault of our own, the stress, I get phone calls every day from farmers who, who are law abiding, honest church going people who are saying, Steve, I've butchered 30, 40, 50 of my animals. I've had no market. I've lost my opportunity to sell. I don't know how long I can hold on. What's going on? What should I do? I, I, I can't market my animals. And so the stress is real. These people have been painted into a corner. They've had their income taken away and they've had their expenses increased through, I believe, unnecessary legislation. So, so these farmers, they're stressed out. I'm stressed out. Um, it's unbelievable the stress that we're feeling. We don't know which way to turn. Our businesses have been taken from us, a 30 year business. My business turns 30 years old this spring. I've got a son who built a house on my property who planned on taking it over for the next 30 years. His house is half finished and the movement bans come into place. Boom, he's done. He has no more income coming in. 
We're sitting on my farm feeding 136 animals and we can't afford to feed them because I'm out up to $200,000 just in lost revenue from these last shows. So, so my, my bank account has been robbed and now I got to maintain my animals. And I don't know what the future holds. This is stress like I've never felt in 30 years of law enforcement. We don't know which way to turn. People will be calling me all afternoon wondering how this hearing went. This is stress that shouldn't have been put on people. Thank you, Mr. Porter. Uh, next, we have uh, Mr. Steve Yucatel. Do you identify yourself for the record and uh, proceed with your uh, testimony? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sundin and, and uh, committee members for allowing me to testify today. My name is Steve Yucatel. Uh, I have Pro River Whitetails in Candy, Ohio County. Um, and uh, I'll be brief. Uh, when animal movements are shut down, our businesses are shut down. Um, that's exactly what happened to so many family farms last fall. For myself and other preserve owners in Minnesota, we did not raise enough deer to supply for our hunts. No deer could be moved, so we couldn't offer hunts to clients who wanted to book with us or were already booked with us. They had to go elsewhere and we lost our sales and their business. Our current clients have lost faith in our ability to provide our service to them. Other deer farmings in Minnesota were scheduled to sell during the time of the movement bans. They were forced to hold back their animals through no fault of their own. They now need to hold them for another year and hope they can move them next fall. They weren't able to make those critical sales. They now have the added expense of keeping these animals for another year in addition to their usual farm expenses. They have the added risk of these animals dying before they can market them in the fall. With no income from sales, they need to figure out how they're going to pay their farm expenses for the next year. My own feed costs are up $200 per ton from last year. It's impossible to run a business when you're not allowed to sell your products. It's impossible to have a farm when you can't sell your crops. Knowing that the DNR can shut down clean, healthy farms whenever an in-state or out-of-state deer tests positive for CWD, everyone must now rethink their business models going forward. Add to these problems the current state of gas prices and inflation, and the stress is unbelievable. I hear it almost daily in my conversations with other farmers. The extent of the financial and emotional damage goes much farther and deeper than I could ever touch on in just a couple minutes. This bill provides much needed help for the reasonable farmers who are now struggling because of the actions of the DNR. I ask that you give your support to Bill HF 3903 today. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have uh, Nicole Neeser uh, and uh, possibly Michelle Medina uh, from the department. Please offer your testimony. Identify yourself and offer your testimony. Mr. Chair, I think they're just available for questions. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Available for questions. I get that. Okay. Uh, well, then we are doing well. Uh, you have uh, uh, plenty of additional written testimony there. Uh, and I'm sure this discussion will continue in the next bill or two. Uh, so uh, any questions from the committee for the author or the uh, testifiers? Okay, I see uh, Robert Gorecki, DNR. Mr. Chair, thank you. I just wanted to make uh, one, one uh, mention for the committee here, just so that they're aware. All three times the DNR uh, enacted movement bans was in reaction and response to positive CWD positive deer in deer farms within the state or out of the state that imported deer and moved deer across the state. And I just want to remind the committee um, that that is the reason why we were doing that. And it isn't uh, through no fault of anybody's. Uh, I'm not trying to point anything out to any particular person, but it is in response to the deer farm and the deer farm industry and the movement of potentially CWD positive deer. That's it. Thank you. Thank you for that input. Uh, we can move on to uh, Representative Anderson. I'm gonna remind people to keep their uh, questions clear and uh, concise and uh, also hope the answers are clear and concise. Representative Anderson, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, uh, I rise or I guess I'm sitting here saying I fully support this bill um, as a fellow farmer. Um, it's really hard to understand the stress that these, these deer farmers have gone through seeing their, their livelihood literally stopped and um, them being held kind of uh, in limbo as to what they can do or not. So I think uh, this bill is warranted. I think it's uh, what the state should do to help somewhat allay the, uh, the financial damages done to our deer farmers 
And again, I thank Representative Burkle for offering this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Chair Eklund, please. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I don't have a question. It was just uh, more of a, a comment. And I, I appreciate the uh, gentleman, from, gentleman from DNR law enforcement. When we have anything that happens, there are his comments on why that happened. When we have anything happen in our, in our farming industry that is a disease or can be transmitted, Board of Animal Health and the DNR does a terrific job of reacting quickly to it. And that's what they did is they reacted quickly. I understand the stress the deer farmers are under, but the stress of our wild white-tailed deer could be facing the same thing. And that's what I've been working on to make sure that, that uh, we save that industry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chair Eklund. Uh, Chair Hansen, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, although the testimony is compelling, it also would set a dramatic uh, a precedent for compensation for various actions needed to uh, uh, respond to either a pandemic or a disease outbreak. Um, I don't think we want to go there. I would recommend no vote uh, on the bill. Okay, thank you. Uh, um, I will make a comment. I am touched by the uh, stories of the people uh, that operate these uh, deer farms and uh, you know, I'm inclined to uh, uh, support this bill at this time and send it on to the uh, Chair Hansen's committee for additional discussion. So uh, uh, that, that's where I'm at with uh, Representative Burkle. Uh, you have the final word. Uh, thank, uh, Representative Luke, do you want time for Luke? Representative Luke. Oh, I'm answer. sorry, I didn't see I didn't see uh, Representative Luke, please. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, sure would be nice if we were doing this uh, old school where we were sitting all in the same room. Um, I, yeah, I, I uh, uh, just uh, one want to uh, remind the committee, particularly those that have had spent some time uh, in the, on the agriculture side and the history of the Board of Animal Health. Uh, we had a huge buyout program in Northwest Minnesota uh, for livestock producers that were caught up in the uh, tuberculosis situation when uh, the state lost their uh, TB free status and we had extreme restrictions on where cattle could move, uh, that type of thing. So please disregard the comment that uh, one of my fellow uh, uh, committee members made about there's this is, you know, no precedence for this. Yes, there is a precedence for this. Uh, uh, and this was. Uh, frankly had nothing to do with uh, the uh, tuberculosis in the cattle. We knew, we knew how to find us. This was to protect the, wi the white-tailed deer. As you remember, we had for a short time uh, tuberculosis endemic to the white-tailed deer up in the Skyme and Four Corners area. Uh, and so we actually bought out livestock producers, asked them to stop, sell their herds, get rid of the uh, the whole works and refrain from from uh, that profession in the interest of protecting the white deer herd, deer herd. So I I just don't want people to get the false impression here that this is this this approach and it's uh, in its infancy uh, has not been done. I mean when you know when when you damage people, uh, it's appropriate that uh, the government. Uh, uh, <coughs> You know, make make them whole. We have a pretty basic federal constitution that dictates that. So, but again, I just want to make sure we got the record straight that uh, there's nothing new about compensation and including the subject of uh, potentially a buyout. I know this bill isn't specific to a buyout, but please let's not let's not uh, rewrite history that's clearly in the record books with the accounts and the amount of money that was spent on previous buyouts to protect the white male herd, deer herd. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Lewick. Uh, Representative Lip Lippert, we are up against the clock again, so uh, please. Uh, thank you, just a quick comment. I think my concerns about this bill and this precedent is, you know, I, as I hear testimony, I think a primary concern, primary purpose is about entertainment more than uh, traditional agricultural uses. So. That's my concern and why I'll, why I'll be a no, a no today. Okay. All right. Uh, 
Representative Burkle, uh, I mentioned I, I plan on supporting this bill and sending it on to the uh, next committee stop. Uh, but uh, that's my two cents. Uh, I encourage the committee to vote their conscience. Uh, Representative Burkle, last word. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll just say quickly that, you know, I've always kind of adhered to the, the quote of, you know, do what you love and you'll never work another day in your life. And, you know, these farmers are doing what they love. They've done it for generations. They're generational family farms. They're small, diverse farms that Representative Rick Hansen really loves. I, I just think without reimbursement to deer farmers at some point, you know, these DMR imposed movement bans uh, really amount to a taking by the government. There's precedence for this. We owe these guys something. Um, until we figure out how we're gonna handle deer farms in the future, whether it's buyouts, um, whatever whatever that conversation is in the next, uh, as we hear these next two bills, um, I just want everyone to understand that the emotional and financial stress these guys are under is, is real and we need to at least um, recognize that and, and somehow compensate them for it. So with that, I'll renew my motion that House File 3903 uh, as amended be recommended to be referred to the Environment Committee. Okay, Mr. Smith, would you please call the vote? Chair Sundin. Aye. Sundin votes aye. Vice Chair Vang. No. Vang votes no. Representative Anderson. Anderson, aye. Anderson votes aye. Representative Burkle. Aye. Burkle votes aye. Representative Eklund. No. Eklund votes no. Representative Hansen R. No. Hansen R votes no. Representative Hansen J. No. Hanson J votes no. Representative Cleveland. Cleveland, um, Cleveland's going to vote aye. Cleveland aye. Representative Lippert. Lippert no. Lippert no. Representative Lewick. Lewick aye. Lewick aye. Representative Miller. Miller aye. Miller aye. Representative Nelson. Nelson aye. Nelson aye. Representative Thompson. Thompson, no. Thompson, no. Seven ayes and six noes, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, with that, uh, seven ayes and six uh, nays, uh, uh, House File 3684 is headed off to the uh, uh, Natural Resources Committee. Next up, we have uh, uh, the Heinzman Bill. Okay, where are we at? Number three, Heinzman. Uh, there might have been a mix up next to Mr. Chair. My bill is 3684. Oh, excuse me. Uh, the last one was 3904 for the record. Next up is uh, Heinzman 3684. Please uh, introduce your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I do want to first acknowledge that. Uh, this is, I think, the very first servant farm buyout bill that uh, has been heard in the last four years. And Mr. Chair, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to present it. Uh, I'll be extremely brief as we have uh, limited time today. Essentially what we have is, uh, over the last few years, a lot of regulatory legislation moving forward and I think we're at that point where we, we need to have this conversation. And that's really what this bill is. It's a starting point to see uh, if we should, and if we should, how uh, move forward with, uh, with a buyout for deer farmers. As we just heard in the previous presentation, that there's a lot of uh, difficulties that deer farmers are facing here in Minnesota. And maybe this is the best option for those folks if they so choose. So starting in line 1.15, it's a buyout beginning January, excuse me, July 1st, 2022. Um, and at that point, um, the board must not approve a new registration of a deer farm going forward. So that's the first part of the bill. And then going on beyond that, um, there is a open appropriation there for those that will have questions about that. We're still looking to see and try and figure out uh, what is the cost of this? Because at the moment, 
uh, we don't entirely know. Since like I said, this is a starting point. Then uh, getting into the meat and potatoes of what is about a hundred words as, uh, as we go through the bill. Um, the commissioner must establish a buyout payment uh, under amounts and criteria with the animal disposed of as, a, as determined by the Board of Animal Health. So uh, there's a narrow window between the date I mentioned earlier and October 1st for deer farmers to decide if, if this is the uh, right choice for them. And I would open up the conversation to uh, however the chair would like to proceed. That is the bill in a nutshell. Okay, uh, thank you, Representative Heinzman. Uh, uh, I'll move that the House File 3684 be recommended and referred to the Committee on Environment and Natural Resources. Uh, so the bill is actually before us at this point. Uh, your testifiers uh, are lined up. We have Mr. Craig Engwall. Uh, please identify yourself and uh, offer your testimony. Mr. Chair and members, I'm Craig Engwall. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Deer Hunters Association and its 60 chapters and members. I have submitted written testimony today, so I will be very brief in my comments and rely on the, the written testimony that I provided. We are here today to support the provisions contained in HF 3684. We think this is part of the overall solution. We're trying to find a common ground to address the issues that have been before us for several years. And we do think uh, a voluntary buyout combined with a moratorium on new registrations is part of that solution. We do strongly feel that the funding for this voluntary buyout should be from based from the general fund and not deer license dollars or game and fish dollars as deer hunters have already contributed millions of dollars from deer license revenue for the surveillance that's gone on, gone on over the past 20 years or so. Um, we also, as I mentioned, and it's in my testimony, we think this is part of a package that involves other measures such as testing of animals, import and movement restrictions, et cetera. But I will not get into that now. I just want to say that we strongly support this bill as part of an overall package to address the issues before you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. And next up, uh, Mr. Porter, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Yes. Um, as I said earlier, my farm turns 30 years old this spring and uh, I have been damaged to the point where I don't, I don't see a path going forward where I can continue my business. The extreme regulations that's come upon us, the, the DNR shutdowns have, have uh, we've never fought a disease that way where we have one infected farm and then we shut down an entire industry, an entire state that has had no contact with it. Uh, my expenses have gone through the roof through the, uh, the extra legislation and my profit has been minimized to almost nothing. So we keep saying it's a voluntary buyout and I feel like it's wink, wink, nod, nod voluntary because there's nothing voluntary about it. I can step forward now and take my medicine. The stress is unbelievable. My expenses have gone through the roof through all this legislation, it was well orchestrated. And here I am today with no income struggling, trying to figure out how to feed 136 animals. So will I step forward for a vol voluntary buyout? What choice do I have? I don't have a choice. It was well orchestrated, well played, stress is through the roof. And I've got 40 people that call me daily in our industry that are wondering, what are we gonna do? Their marriages are falling apart. Their blood pressure's through the roof. Many of these guys have shot and killed their animals, thrown them in a pit because they couldn't afford to feed them. Their animals were getting thin. And uh, this, this was done at the hands of my state. I served 30 years in law enforcement in this state and I never dreamt my own state would come after me and it would do it falsely. I have a closed herd. I have never haven't brought a new deer on my farm for 12 to 15 years. I'm enrolled in a CWD program that tests animals. It's recognized, scientifically proven. And yet I'm being ran out of business. So am I in favor of a buyout? Yeah, I am. But nobody's talked about the amount or the price. The stress is through the roof. People are waiting, hanging on. They've been painted into a corner. And th this whole scenario could turn bad. It could turn bad real quick because the stress is through the roof. And I'm asking that this body would have the decency to treat deer farmers with respect going forward. 
and 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 treat us like the farmers. I listened in an earlier hearing. You're you're talking about promoting farming in Minnesota. We did exactly that. We started family farms. My farm's 30 years old. I started a farm from nothing. I did it all myself, and my state has taken it from me. That's where I'm at. Thank you, Mr. Porter. Okay. Uh, Mr. Yucatel, please. Welcome back to the committee. Thank you, Chair Sandine and committee members. Um, so uh, this bill sheds light on a terribly difficult position that farmers are in today. Um, why are we here? You ask any farmer in outstate Minnesota if they would be interested in selling off their family operation, you would get a resounding no. If you asked deer farmers this question a year ago, you would get the same answer, absolutely not. Uh, but now you ask the same question, but I'll add that you can't sell anything off your farm. You can raise your crops, but you can't sell them. Now, what would that answer look like? Today, we're talking about the systematic destruction of a farming group right here in Minnesota. For years and years, there's been bills put forth by legislators who have intent to destroy our farms. They've tried to legislate us out of business. And each year, we present you education, logic, and sound science to support our position. We have always used the strength and power of the truth to win these issues. Our legislators hear us, understand, and take appropriate action when they vote on those bills. But hostile legislators, knowing that they can't destroy our farms through legislative action, decided to take a different approach. They figured out a way to destroy our farms by using DNR oversight as their tactic. We all know how that's working out. We've done everything right. We followed all the rules and regulations, paid our fees, and been proper and compliant. Today, sadly, our truth, logic, and science is irrelevant. We now have deer farmers who are feeding their animals. We have no clue how, if they'll ever be able to sell them. The legislature has guided us here, and that's why we're here. We're asking you to move forward with this bill as a courtesy to offer a solution to the good people who've been wronged by the state. Any money that might be appropriated for this bio would be used wisely and go directly to help Minnesota's farming community. And for those farmers who are interested in an honest, fair, and equitable buyout, this bill could present them with that opportunity. We support this bill and we ask that you do too. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Yucatel. Uh, Chair Eklund, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and first off, I want to I want to thank Representative Heinzman. Uh, today we had a very good conversation in his office. Uh, we talked about that yesterday in a previous committee hearing about having that conversation, and we're and we're, and we, and, uh, we're doing it. Uh, Representative Heinzman, did um, is there a? I know it's an open appropriation right now. Is there any idea what these animals are worth? So, because I assume. I assume a, a, a yearling is worth less than a four-year-old buck. So I had, do we have a price range on what it's gonna to take to buy these farms out? Representative Heinzman, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Representative Becklin, thank you for the question. Uh, quite honestly, at the moment, the only real baseline we have is the federal program that of course is in place in, in, in scenarios where you have sick animals. And uh, there is, uh, you know, that to, to look at, but otherwise going forward, it, it's very much, as I said at the beginning, a, a starting point for the conversation. And I, I do not have hard numbers that I am willing to, or available to suggest. You know, I think that's something that we leave to experts and that's why I wrote the language the way that we did. Uh, follow up, Representative Eklund? Yeah, real quickly, Mr. Chair, thank you. And, and thank you for that answer, uh, Representative Heinzman. I think if the committee members read all these letters, and, and thank you to the uh, uh, servant farmers that, that submitted the letters, I think there's a wide uh, variety of, a wide variety and maybe a wide range of what the, what these animals are worth and what a, what a buyout would, would be. So first off, at this time, I'm gonna vote no on this on this bill moving forward, but I am willing to work with you and with the deer farmers to figure out if this is the appropriate action going forward, because there are certainly other CWD pieces of legislation available. Um, and I'll just finish, Mr. Chair. Uh, I appreciate the testimony from the deer farmers, but we did have, and I, uh, 
OXO, uh, the legislative auditor report that found that there was 34% non-compliance on inspections. That's an issue, uh, Mr. Chair and members, that, that has not been addressed. And that's part of the reason why we've been working on figuring out the CWD thing for uh, four, year, four plus years. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you, Chair Eklund. Uh, Representative Miller, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a just a brief comment on this. Um, this subject matter that we're covering in an ag committee in the state of Minnesota is chilling. I, I, I can't believe that we are having a conversation like this in the state of Minnesota. This, this is an agricultural state. As you've heard from the couple of testimony, I'm sure the other letters basically support this. We, we've destroyed legitimate business owners. And we've said that this business is no longer a legitimate business in the state. And now our solution is to buy them out. Stay tuned. Many other businesses, not only in agriculture, but the state determines that someone else should not operate a business in Minnesota. We're going to angle them around to the point to where we knock them out of business and then they come begging that we give them a little bit of money. And then from the tone that I'm hearing, from the chair of the other committee is, is we're not going to give them any money anyway. Basically, screw you. I, I, I cannot believe it, the first time I started hearing these bills a couple of years ago, I, I just thought this was just the ravings of, you know, a radical small group of people. And now as a state of Minnesota, we have arrived at the point to where we are going to kill and bury and then hopefully give some money to an entire industry. I will not be part of any of this. I, I, Representative Heinzman, I understand what you're trying to do with this bill, and I know that it's probably the only solution left, but I cannot participate in what I think borders on a criminal act by the state of Minnesota. This is, this is humiliating that I have had to be part of this, and I won't condone any of it. Thank you, Representative Miller. Representative Burkle, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be quick. I just wanted to chime in exactly uh, same sentiments that Representative Miller just expressed. And I'll go back to Representative Lindbergh's comment, comment on my bill, uh, specifically citing, you know, entertainment. He didn't see entertainment as a viable business enterprise. Uh, and, and I would just make the claim that, you know, these guys aren't selling heroin. They're not selling meth. This has been a legitimate business for years. Um, and, and we've changed the rules. We've changed the ground underneath them. And, and I agree with Representative Miller. Um, what we're doing here is just absolutely wrong, and but we're pushed to, to to a point where we have no choice but to somehow make things right with these guys. I don't know what the right answer is. I'm willing to work with Representative Eklund on solutions as well, and I want to thank Representative Heinzman for bringing, bringing the bill forward. Uh, somehow we have to resolve this, and, and I'm hoping to be part of that solution as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. In all fairness to the next bill, uh, uh, Please be brief with your comments or questions. Uh, Representative Cleveland, please. Yes, thank you. And um, you know, um, I have some concerns as well. Um, I understand that people are hurting and um, that um, entities are suffering. You know, and maybe um, we need to look at this in a broader picture, Representative uh, Heinzman. I, I, I'm trying to figure out here, is this really an ag issue? Is this a commerce issue? You know, uh, how do we define, um, it, in my mind, I'm struggling with, are we going to be competing against ourselves as the state uh, without having the prices established before we pass the bill? And, and I um, kind of in, in the same camp as Representative Eklund, I'd like to work with you to figure out what fair price would look like if we were to go down that road. And then to Representative Miller's uh, comment, I'm in lockstep agreement with him too. How do we decide which businesses we would buy out that have received and then what are acceptable harms and what are not acceptable harms? So I'm just, I'm really struggling with this and today I'm gonna be a no vote, but, um, I want you to know that I would be willing to work with you going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Cleveland. Uh, Representative Lewick, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I guess uh, I wanted to go on the record and uh, make sure that uh, the folks out there listening uh, to uh, the comment about entertainment. So 
uh, I deer hunt. Uh, some would consider that entertainment. That's a sport uh, that I enjoy. Uh, grouse, I've not had the opportunity to hunt pheasants in years, but to label a group uh, as this is an entertainment industry, uh, yet uh, we're going to snuff them off the face of the earth uh, for another industry that, that uh, is legitimate, but uh, with rare exception, and, and I will categorically de you know, defend that reception, there's very few uh, folks out there that buy a hunting and fishing license and depend on that as their sole ability to survive. So I just want to make that clear. I think that was uncalled for. It shows sort of a recklessness with the, hey, the way we're going to treat uh, folks. With respect to the comment about uh, there are processes uh, that can be worked out uh, if you, some of the historic ways they've dealt with uh, one, there is an appraisal process for livestock, just like there is for your automobile, a little different than the blue book value and stuff like that. And, uh, and in the interest of having a reasonable way to control the cost, uh, for example, uh, when we did that with beef cattle, there was a cap applied so that even if you had a $12,000 pride bull uh, and that's what you paid for it, you had the receipt for it, you weren't going to get $12,000 for it. Uh, uh, by the same token, how do you put the value on a kid's 4-H animal that now is going to have to be slaughtered? How do you, how do you, how do you appraise that uh, uh, that value. So what we're looking at here is something that did, definitely needs some more work. Uh, but make no mistake, uh, Representative Cleborn, this process of eliminating people's livestock is ugly. It's tension filled. Uh, and while it may be fine to sit back and throw rocks at those folks, you are exactly right. And I know from your background, you understand uh, human stress. And we are unnecessarily, literally torturing a group of people here in the state of Minnesota, uh, as uh, uh, Representative Miller indicated. But uh, uh, you know, we we can do better than this, and just simply uh, hold these people up as a bunch of scoundrels. And unfortunately, that is the tone that some uh, have used. Uh, and I think it's unfair. And I, I would hope we would uh, we would stop doing that. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Look, look uh, Chair Hansen's up next and last. Uh, we do have another bill uh, before us. Chair Hansen, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I would encourage the committee to reject uh, the conspiracy theories, the accusations of intent, uh, the accusations or the illusion that something bad could happen if we don't pass this bill that chilling uh, comment. It, we, we have to work in a professional manner uh, and we can't accept the idea that there is a conspiracy that needs to result in funding. So I would uh, encourage a no vote. Uh, there will continue to be work on this because this appears this is the only thing the other body will be doing. Thank you, Chair Hanson. Uh, see no other comments. Uh, uh, the motion for us is House File 3684 be referred to the Committee on Environment and Natural Resources. Uh, Representative uh, Heinzman, last word. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you again, Chair Sending, for actually hearing this bill. It, it is one of the most difficult issues that I've seen brought to this legislature, uh, at least for me personally, with so many uh, bills coming forward and not to be especially adversarial, but to Representative Hansen's comments and others, Democrats have, for the most part, with some exceptions, been exclusively pushing regulatory bills for the last four years and beyond without any 
real solution to help these farmers. If you're gonna regulate them out of business, help them transition with uh, some kind of dollars to compensate them for their loss. And so that's why I brought this bill forward. It's, it's just been uh, one after another after another. And, you know, and I sympathize, Bill specifically brought forward on this issue, regulatory bills. And I sympathize with Representative Miller's comments and others. I don't wanna be a part of, of going after the deer farm industry. I wanna be a part of the solution. And I would hope that Democrats would join me in doing that. But as we've heard from a number of members already, they're not willing to make that step. At least that seems to be the indication. But the bill is being heard. And uh, as I've mentioned before, thank you Chair Sundin for that. It's good that we actually have a starting point. I hope that those watching at home are recognizing that it's Republicans that are taking and making this step. And I suspect there will be forthcoming. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chair. Coming from the other oh, side. Oh, excuse me. No, no interruptions at this point, please. And, and I, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would welcome, I would welcome the ongoing continued conversation around this particular proposal, even if I'm not the author. So thank you for the opportunity to speak, Mr. Chairman, again. Thank you. With the indulgence of the uh, uh, author, uh, would you like to hear from uh, Representative Anderson again, briefly? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, would, I would appreciate that. He may have a suggestion as to the motion. Thank you. Representative Anderson, please. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and also thanks to Representative Heinzelman. Mr. Chair, in lieu of the fact that there has been uh, numerous examples here of discussion wanting to be continued, uh, talk of trying to work something out, I would uh, suggest uh, possibly holding this bill over in your committee here where it could be brought up again and we could uh, continue working on uh, working out some kind of a possible solution. So Mr. Chair, that would be my suggestion to you to uh, reconsider and, and hold this bill over. In Are you withdrawing your motion? Representative Anderson. I don't know if I had him, I would. Uh, I, 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 I moved it, but. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I guess I would move to uh, reconsider your motion to lay the bill over and uh, keep it in the Ag Committee. I'd uh, be amenable to that. Uh, so we heard the motion to, I guess, uh, reconsider and uh, hold this over, hold the uh, uh, 3684 over in committee for further discussion. Uh, any questions on that? Be uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Uh, all opposed? No. Okay. Uh, uh, the ayes have it. Uh, this uh, 3684 be uh, held in committee for further discussion. Uh, that wraps that up. We've got uh, about 20 minutes left for the uh, last bill. Uh, Chair Hanson, would you like to move your bill? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I would move the bill and I have testifiers from the DNR that I would prefer to have them speak before we move the amendment. Okay, uh, please, uh, the wrap to, uh, Captain Gorecki. Is that your testifier? Yes. Okay, Captain Gorecki, please. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, committee members. Uh, Captain Robert Gorecki, CWD Enforcement Coordinator for the Minnesota DNR. Uh, before you today is House File 4126 uh, in reference to uh, uh, Deer Farm Administration. Uh, would you like me to go through uh, line by line of the different uh, amendments proposed today or uh, just give you the overall summary? The floor is yours, I'd uh, appreciate a summary. Very good. Some of the highlights here that would be important to mention, uh, this would be in, in regards to uh, several rule changes to uh, Minnesota Statute 35.155, uh, uh, restricting um, servant running at large, uh, some technical changes on uh, reporting of escaped deer. Uh, that is one of the big issues that we've had across the state of Minnesota over the last 10 years. Just in the last, uh, last six months of uh, 2021, we had eight escape incidents across the state of Minnesota. 
In the last five years, we've had 60 escape incidents across the state of Minnesota involving 158 servants. Uh, and in the last 10 years, we've had 159 escape incidents. These are where farm deer escape with the current regulations that we have into the wild. Uh, some are found, some are not, some are destroyed, but this here poses a significant risk to the wild herds and CWD spread across the state. One of the other important pieces to this is escaped deer um, is allowing hunters, if they come upon these deer, to be able to put these deer down uh, at no liable um, loss um, for them uh, to the owner of that animal if it is an escaped servant. Uh, moving forward, there is uh, redundant gating and redundant fencing um, amendments, again, to try to restrict the uh, exposure of wild deer to uh, farm deer. Currently right now, through the audit that we did, there was a lot of nose to nose contact, a lot of um, direct contact between wild deer and farm deer. And that's, again, poses a significant threat to our wild herds. Moving forward through the bill, um, all deer that are registered um, under a farm has to be tagged within 14 days. This is an important thing, again, for identifying farm deer if they do escape into the wild. Some technical changes they're making that uh, quicker within 14 days of birth. Moving forward into the bill here, um, the Board uh, of Animal Health will not allow new white-tailed deer registrations um, in the state of Minnesota. Uh, I believe the effective date of this is September 1st. And uh, probably one of the biggest things is moving the administration over from the Board of Animal Health to the DNR for administration of white-tailed deer farms across the state of Minnesota. So uh, those are the overall highlights, trying to summarize the um, uh, seven page bill for you briefly here. Um, there is money for appropriation for RT quick testing as well that I think is important to mention. Um, and then some technical date changes as far as the current uh, rules for live testing and post-mortem testing with this RT quick, if that does uh, get approved by the Department of Ag. Thank you, Captain Correct, Gurecki. Um, uh, next up we have uh, Mr. Tim Speck, please. Welcome back. back. Welcome back to the committee. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Um, Tim Spreck with the Minnesota Deer Farmers Association. Um, I know that you're up against the clock. We've dealt with a number of these provisions. I would say almost 95% of this bill in the past, either here or in the Environment Committee. So um, what I'm going to do, instead of going through a seven-page bill line by line and indicating our opposition and concern, I'm going to just move to a couple of new provisions uh, with the caveat that the Minnesota deer farmers have a great deal of concern about this. Once again, this is death by a thousand cuts, and it really would end the industry if it was passed in full. So my comments today, I'm going to look at uh, the importation items on line 5.22 to 5.31 uh, of the amendment where it deals with importation of live deer and or semen. Um, the first piece of that, uh, this is something we haven't had before. So the first piece of that is already taken care of. Uh, USDA does not allow importation uh, of live deer or semen from any infected or exposed areas. That is something you can put a red X through, not necessary. Uh, and, and the thing that we wanna to address with regard to this particular section is that uh, restricting the entire state in the lines below is really overkill. What we're doing is we're saying if there was a positive somewhere in the state, the entire, entire state or province is off limits for importation. That's just really a revenue killer. It's a commerce killer. And it also limits the ability of the uh, Minnesota deer farmers to do to business and the importation of semen is very critically important because it helps them to uh, genetically uh, improve their herds and what they're doing. And most people don't know this because we've never really talked about it or had an opportunity. We have entire deer farms in Minnesota that have been sequenced and DNA resistant to, to uh, CWD. They continually do this. They are masters at genetic engineering. And this is something that importation of semen allows them to increasingly increase the diversity of their herd in terms of CWD resistance. So what we should be doing is looking at the deer farmers as a partner in CWD because of the expert work that they've done 
in genetically sequencing and, and breeding for CWD resistance. And with that, Mr. Chair, I will step aside and let you get on to your next testifier. Thank you very much. Uh, just another reminder, we do have uh, department uh, professionals on tap as well. Uh, Chair Hansen, would you like to move your uh, amendment? Yes, and uh, Mr. Chair, just to clarify, 4126 uh, is an agency bill that was brought to me. And then the DE1, which I am moving now, is the language uh, that uh, was passed uh, uh, yesterday in, uh, uh, from Representative Eklund. So it is being brought in front of the Ag Committee as well. It was heard in Environment Committee. And I would move the DE1 amendment to get the bill in the shape I would like. Any particular questions on the uh, DE1 from the committee? Okay, seeing none, uh, all those in favor of the DE1 to signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, please say nay. Nay. Okay. Okay, that motion prevails. The DE amendment is adopted. Chair Hansen, uh, House File 4126 as amended is before us. Please uh, continue with your presentation and uh, discussions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I believe uh, um, Mr. Gorecki had uh, discussed described both, uh, so I uh, wasn't intending to do that, but he did He did do that. So um, I think we've had uh, some debate and we have the written testimony. I would ask for your support for 40, 4126 to be moved to the Environment Committee uh, as amended. Okay, uh, that's uh, terrific. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have uh, some discussion here. Uh, Representative Anderson, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Hansen mentioned that uh, 4126 in its original form was an agency bill. Um, so either a question directed to him or to Mr. Gorecki, where did the language of the DE amendment come from? Whose language is that? Representative Hansen, Chair Hansen, please. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative <clears throat> Anderson. As I mentioned, that came uh, from uh, Representative Eklund. It was yesterday in the Environment Committee. So it's the parallel language, the DE is from that. And then it includes the 4126. So as a DE, it includes the 4126 that was from the agency, plus uh, provisions from Representative Eklund's bill. Representative Anderson, follow up. Well, I understand where the, the, the bill came from and the author, but the, the, the language itself, um, you know, somebody called this death by a thousand cuts i'd call this death by a sledgehammer to the to the deer industry and um you know if, if some of this language came from the dnr itself uh, to me it, it would show that the, they are certainly are not an impartial state agency in trying to regulate uh, a certain segment of the uh, the ag economy um and being that mr gorecki went through the bill itself and explained it um it, it's just so surprising that uh, he would be uh, promoting a bill like this that, that certainly would, would take away any chance of surviving from the, the folks that they're trying to regulate in a, in a manner that would somehow keep them in business. So um, I'm gonna be against this, this bill, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thank you, uh, Representative Anderson. Uh, Representative Lewick, please. Uh, yeah, thank you. I just, uh, not to, duplicate what uh, uh, Representative Anderson said, but uh, it appears there's something glaringly missing in here, and, it, and, it, and then that includes the DNR's proposal. Uh, uh, since they want to take this whole thing over, I don't see uh, any producer representation uh, mechanism in, the, in their system, uh, which I guess you know, I don't want to speculate, but it would lead to that this is just simply a terminal move. Why bother to have uh, a, a, a your own little board of animal DNR uh, to deal with the uh, people you're regulating uh, if this isn't just a terminal bill to eliminate uh, deer farming in the state of Minnesota? So maybe Commissioner Meyer can explain what mechanisms uh, in, in the governor's proposal here, uh, I'm assuming he buys into this, uh, is there for the deer farmers, the customers, the, the regulated group uh, to have uh, any uh, 
you know, uh, relationship with the DNR other than simply a, kind of a law enforcement here, here, we're here with the badge uh, approach to regulation. So maybe, maybe Commissioner Meyer could expound on that. I see he's here. Commissioner Meyer, can you help us out, please? Unmute yourself and help us out. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Bob Meyer, Assistant Commission Department of Natural Resources. As Representative Hansen outlined previously, the base bill or the beginning bill contain the recommendations from the DNR and the Board of Animal Health on our concurrent authority report that was submitted to the legislature. In that report, we found substantial violations in our inspections with the board. So the recommendations in that report are to help these deer farms come into compliance. And if anybody thinks the DNR is out there to shut down these deer farms, they're completely wrong. Our position is to work with the Board of Animal Health and ensure that these deer farms are operating in the conditions and under the conditions of statute and rule that they're required to. We found over a 30% violation rate on fencing regulations alone within the, the, the farms that we visited. 40, we visited over 50 farms, 30% of them had violations. It's not our intention to shut them down. It's our intention to make sure that these operations are operating safely and within the organizational rules and statutes that are outlined like any other farm, like a turkey farm does, a swine operation, a pig farm, a, a, a cattle operation. So we aren't out there to shut them down. We're making sure that people are operating safely, protecting a, the wild farm deer inside of the pen and the wild deer outside of the pen. So uh, our, our Robert Gorecki went through the entire amendment uh, trying to ease up, give us some time here. Uh, maybe he shouldn't have, he should have referred to the base bill and let Representative Hansen deal with the amendment. But we've been tracking these issues as everybody has in all of these other bills. So to say that his presenting of the amendment is our endorsement of it is completely wrong. And our position on, on taking over the, the whole program, we are ready to do that should the legislature desire and present that to us. Concurrent authority has given us the ability to learn and understand how to enforce and inspect these facilities. We're currently in the position of operate or developing a memorandum of understanding with the board that will clearly identify those procedures moving forward. We look forward to sharing that with you in the coming weeks, Mr. Chairman. I hope that answers some questions. Thank you very much. Uh, very quickly, uh, Representative yeah, Bullock, any, yeah. anything else? Thank you, Mr. No, I appreciate that because that was bad, sorely needed. I appreciate Commissioner Myers clarifying that that uh, Mr. Gorecki was not presenting the uh, governor and Commissioner Strauman's specific uh, proposal here. Uh, and again, you know, I guess uh, as somebody that lived in that world for a short time when it when it appears everybody's shooting at you, uh, you just kind of look over the hill and if they're on the other side of the hill and the bullets seem to be coming that way, you may, you may make some, some conclusions that aren't true. So I, yeah, I appreciate the commissioner, uh, uh, Meyer, uh, clarifying that, uh, uh, that that amendment is not the agency's position. Thank you. Okay, thank you. See no more uh, hands up. Uh, we'll move to the uh, author for, uh, uh, closing comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think you have a minute left. I would ask for your support. And again, uh, uh, I will take responsibility for uh, uh, Officer Gorecki. That was not his. Uh, I was unclear in my direction. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm looking forward to working on this really hard next year uh, as well. So, okay. The Hanson motion is to recommend that House file. 4126 as amended be referred to the Committee on Environment and Natural Resources. Uh, this is the motion before us. Mr. Smith, please call the vote. Chair Sundin. I'm um, an aye. Sundin votes aye. Representative Vang. Aye. Vang votes aye. Representative Anderson. Anderson, no. Anderson, no. Representative Burkle. Burkle, no. Burkle, no. Representative Eklund. Aye. Eklund, aye. Representative Hanson R. Hanson R, I. Hanson R, I. Representative Hanson J. I. Hanson J, I. Representative Cleavorn. Cleavorn, I. Cleavorn, I. Representative Lippert. Lippert, I. Lippert, I. Representative Lewick. Lewick, no. 
No, Representative Miller. Miller, no. Miller, no. Representative Nelson. Nelson, no. Nelson, no. Representative Thompson. Yes. Thompson, aye. Eight ayes, five nays, Mr. Chair. Okay, there being eight ayes and five nays, this motion prevails and the bill is on its uh, way to its next stop. Thank you, Chair Hansen. Uh, we're adjourned.